Okay, so we got through conjure keys, right? This is where we ended. Mm -hmm. Who are the conjure keys? Sharks, yeah, sharks and rays and skates. What's special about their uh, skeleton? It's made of cartilage. Yeah, it's made of cartilage. That's what chondro means, right? Chondro keys just means cartilage fish. So before we go forward, let's go back. So we got to sharks. Uh, what is a Napa stone? What does the word Napa stone mean? It's on the mouth. Thank you. Yeah, so Napa means jaw, right? And stone is, a, is an opening or a pore, right? So we're talking about mouth in this case. Um, so if we rewind even further to the A Napa or Ag Napins, what does the A mean in front of the, the bathroom? Without, right? So, what do these guys not have? They don't have jaws, right? They also don't have paired fins. Okay, so remember both of those innovations appear in um, conjure keys first in our in our lineage. We looked at the tree, we talked a little bit about the debate between cephalochordates and viracordates and who's most closely related to uh, modern vertebrates. Who did we decide based on most uh, the most reliable molecular data is more closely related to modern vertebrates? Definitely. Yeah, so this tree, that's why this tree is tricky, right? Because it, this is um, straight out of our textbook. But remember, phylogenetic trees are just hypotheses. So this is one way of um, laying out those relationships. But the most recent data actually switches these two uh, lineages. So cephalochordates would be closer. Uricordates are the C sports, right? And cephalochordates are those that sort of look like, um, kind of look like early fishes. Right, so your lance looks like your cephalochordates. That gets us back to where we were. That's a brief review of sort of the groups we got to. I told you we'd pick up with osteichthyes next um, and talk about how we sort of fit into this group. So when we're looking at this tree, we're following the tree all the way out to Homo sapiens, right, where sort of, which is where the conversation about vertebrates will end in this chapter. So that's sort of the direction we're headed, um, is tracing the tree until we land on us. We're going to be looking at smaller and smaller monophyletic groups. Okay, so we're still within um, a monophyletic group called Osteichthyes. We belong there. Okay, so we are in this place. All right, the Osteichthyes are the bony fishes. Look here, most living verte vertebrates, about half, belong to this place. Some bony fish are not fish, right? So no one is saying you are a fish. You are an Osteichthyan, you belong in this group. That just means if you go back to the tree and you go, let's see. Here. Conjunctees, uh, Actinopterygia, those are the first uh, of the bony fishes that we'll talk about. So here is a big monophyletic group with a shared ancestor back here, right? And we're down here in mammals. So we're a member of that group. So when I tell you that you're an Osteichthyan, doesn't mean you're a fish. It means you're in the same monophyletic group as bony fishes. You guys got that? Okay. So I'm going to give you a hint about one question on the exam that is commonly missed. Okay. It's a question that says choose all that are correct. And then you have a list of groups. And it says choose all the ones that you belong in. Okay. And you're going to have choices like Anathen or um, Chondrichthyes or Sarcopterygii, all these groups that we're talking about are going to be options, and you have to pick the ones that you belong in. Okay, so you're essentially tracing the tree to Homo sapiens, okay, but, but not necessarily with a tree, okay, just being able to pick the groups. So you're an Athostone, right? Do you have a job? Yeah, paired appendages. So you're, you're coming down the lineage here. So you're in Osteichthyes. Your skeleton is mineralized. You um, are a land vertebrate. All land vertebrates are considered osteichthyes. Within this group of bony fishes, we're going to subdivide into the ray fin fish and the lobe fin fish. And I put this book cover on here for two reasons. Um, it's a nice illustration of, uh, of a story, right? A journey into the 3.5 billion year history of the human body, sort of tracing us back to our fish ancestors. Um, so it's a nice illustration, but it's also a killer book. So if you guys are interested in this stuff, um, or if you're interested in genetics, development, evo vivo, any of the stuff that we're talking about, this is a really good book to start with. 
Um, I don't know if you guys know who Neil Shubin is, but he's uh, he's like a he's a scientist, but he's also a science communicator. So you'll see him on TV and stuff. He's the on he's got his own PBS special that's also called Your Inner Fish. Um, the nice thing about the book is that it's easy to read. So it's written in a way that like it's easy to understand if you're just starting out learning out about learning about this stuff. Um, it's one of my favorites. It's one of the first books I read on the topic when I was an undergrad and like fell in love with it. So it's really good. Um, I don't know him personally and I don't work for the publisher. So it's not a, an advertisement. I just really think that this is a valuable um, book to read if you're into this stuff. Okay, so I'd like to sort of plug in a little bit. He'll we'll shoot into the in the new world right next. But nonetheless, first uh, branch in the osteichthyes are the ray thin fish, the term for the group of the Actinopterygii. Okay, so these words I realize are a mouthful, but again, if you break them down into their parts, you can sort of uh, remember a little bit better what they mean, what they stand for. So P-T-E-R-Y, Terry, what do you guys think? Can you think of any other words that start with that or have that root word in them? Pterodactyl. What is a pterodactyl? It's a flying, yeah, flying dinosaur relative. Pterodactyl means wing, okay? Dactyl means fingers. So that's pterodactyls, if you ever look at their bones, they're like long fingers looking ones. Anyway, taro means wing. Okay. So actino means rays, like thin filaments. Think about the um the, the cellular component actin, right? It's a protein, it's a filamentous protein. The actino means rays or filaments. So these are your ray fins. It looks like it says ray wing. Okay, but a fish fin is kind of like its wing. Okay, so there's a little, I know it's a stretch, but it might help you to remember. So ray fin fishes are named because their fins are not muscular uh, in structure. And they have these really sort of delicate fit, uh, rays made out of mostly cartilage. And they're really thin. And they're really sort of, I don't know, it's the word I'm looking for, like, I guess delicate, right? Is the word that I'm looking for here. They're not super strong. They don't have bony elements to them. Um, fragile, I guess, is a better word for what I'm what I'm looking at. If you think about a fish fin, um, and most fishes that you would be familiar with are in this group of the Actinopterus guys. Okay, so fishes like trout or tuna or a seahorse or a lionfish or even an eel, right? Most fishes that you can think of off the top of your head are going to fall into this group. Okay. So the ray fin fishes are a huge group, 30,000 plus species, largest class of extant vertebrates, so the biggest group of vertebrates that are alive today, most diverse group, that's these uh, ray fin bony fishes. They have um, slim bladders, sometimes called gas bladders, right, that help them sort of uh, regulate buoyancy or how much they can float in the water column. Gas bladders and swim bladders are homologous to lungs. So these things actually give rise to lungs in later groups. Um, and some fish can still absorb oxygen through them or, or do use them for oxygen absorption. Even though they're using them to fill with air to enable them to float a little bit better, they can also um, be highly vascularized. So there's some gas exchange going on in those swim bladders as well. So those are your ray fin fishes. The sarcopterygii, however, are more in line with the path to vertebrates, or I mean, I'm sorry, tetrapods, land vertebrates. So the sarcopterygii, the same thing we can do here, taro means wing, okay, so you're still talking about their fins, but sarco means flesh. And sarcopterygii have fleshy fins. So instead of their delicate, fragile, sort of uh, graceful looking ray fins that you're used to seeing in most fish, these guys have bony uh, elements. The bones in the fins of these guys are homologous to the bones in your arms and legs. Okay, so the Sarcopterygii are the low fin fishes. They have bones, they have muscles, and their, their appendages are much more like your arms and legs because that's where your arms and legs came from. They're essentially able to uh, almost use them to pull themselves around with, okay? And they do in some instances. So what we're looking at here is instead of those ray fins, you have mu a muscular, pectoral, and pelvic fins uh, surrounding rod-shaped bones, okay? Just like your arms and legs. Coelacanths are in this group. Um, Michael was asking about coelacanths. I'm sorry that he's not here to talk about this group. Um, coelacanths, this is a coelacanth. He's attractive, right? 
these guys are really interesting. Um, we thought they were extinct for like hundreds of years until they found one in the 1930s. And they're like, oh my God, a felicant. So they're not very um, abundant. They're pretty rare, but they're around. They're deep, deep water dwellers. Um, but they have uh, these lobed fins. You've also got lung fishes in this group. Why do you think they're called lung fishes? Any guesses? What do you think they have? Lungs, yeah. They actually breathe with lungs. So their um, gas bladders are fully evolved into lungs. And they actually can go up and gulp air from the surface and go back down. So they're breathing with lungs. Um, and then tetrapods, which is all of us, land vertebrates that walk on four uh, legs. Lungfish are our closest relatives, um, and they, again, depend entirely on lungs, not gills, for breathing. So that, that transition is complete in this group. Um, there's a video you can watch if you're interested in watching the lungfish breathe some air. I'll skip it for now. It's short, but you guys can take a look at it. Um, kind of interesting. All right, so we get through the osteophys. We're still sort of in the osteophys, but we're just narrowing the focus, okay? So we're heading into tetrapods. Um, this is a video that is is uh, definitely going to see you. You will definitely see questions on the exam, bonus questions, most likely. Um, but you should watch this. It's about ten minutes long. Okay, this is an important video um, because it explains the transition, how fish became uh, terrestrial. Okay, so that's an important one. It's because it's long. I'm not going to play it. But what we're talking about here is that that transition. We're talking about the time, that one time, when aquatic vertebrates walked up onto the land. And I'm, I'm joking when I say that one time, because okay, it's a long-term, sort of slow process, kind of like what we talked about with um, plants moving on the land, right? You have to have adaptations in place that allow you to sort of live on the edge. Okay? And this is a, um, an artist rendition of a fossil that we call tiktaalik. And since we found Tiktaalik, there wasn't just one, there's been a bunch more of this found. He was important because of his transitional species between fish and tetrapods or land vertebrates. Okay, so this guy was a sarcopteridian, a low finned fish. So technically still a fish, no legs, no arms, but these paired appendages have those bony elements, including the muscle that surrounds them, and allowed this guy to come up onto the land to do some things, like maybe look for food. Right, maybe get more oxygen, okay, whatever the whatever the sort of driving factors were. But the cool thing about tiktaalik is that even the joints in those appendages are more similar to ours. So it had the ability not only to sort of use straight fins like this to pull itself around on the land, but also to push. So it could actually go from flat on the ground to like pushing up. Right. So the uh, shoulder joints are similar to what we see in um, tetrapods. It's a really critical transitional species. If you read the book, Your Inner Fish, it talks all about it. If you um, watch the, this, we'll talk about Tiktaalik, this video. Okay, so that's a good place to sort of get some more information if you're interested in that transition. So that gets us to tetrapods. Um, tetrapods are going to include amphibians, reptiles, and mammals. Okay, so these are the groups that we're going, that we're working towards here. Tetrapods are terrestrial lobe fin fishes. So we're still in Sartopterygii, okay? So when I ask you what group you're in, you're still in, you're still in this group, okay? Sarcopteridians, low fin fishes. Um, characteristics of tetrapods, four limbs and hands and feet with digits. What are digits? Fingers and toes, right? So it's kind of interesting when you look back at these fossils of these transitional species, early amphibians, sort of late sarcopteridian, early amphibians. Um, they have digits, but they have a bunch of them, see? Like this guy has eight or nine fingers and toes. So the five fingers, five toes thing sort of comes later. Okay, sort of settles in on these on a, a smaller number of digits um, later in evolutionary time. But you see those limbs and you see those digits. These are homologous to those um, tiny bones at the end of the sarcopterygian fins. Okay, so these are all the same bones that you see in the fins of those lobe fin fish. They're just starting to take on different specialization. Um, another thing that you see in tetrapods, tetrapods is the tiny bones in our ears that allow for sound vibrations to be amplified on land. So the way that your eardrums work, you need fluid 
to carry sound waves, okay? In your ear, you have some, okay? But because you are a terrestrial vertebrate, tetrapod, you need to amplify those sound waves because the waves travel differently in air than they do in water. So you have a tiny little collection of three bones in a row that pit on your ear canal that make waves in the tiny little bit of fluid that you have inside of your inner ear. So you're still adapted to hearing underwater, but your whole system is specialized for terrestrial sound collection. Does that make sense? You guys know that you have a little bit of fluid in your ear canal still, right? You know that probably. You may have at least heard about that. Um, but those special bones for detecting sound in air is a tetrapod thing too. Guess where they came from? Pharyngeal gill arches. Okay, so early in development, we talked about those gill slits, right? Pharyngeal slits that all chordates have in common. And I told you that those gill arches move forward and become things like jaws. They also become these ear bones and tetrapods. Okay. Um, let's see. That's pretty good in terms of tetrapods. So that gets us to our first tetrapod group, and that's our amphibians. Um, amphi means two ways or two states. Like, um, let me give a good example of what Jesus, like an amphitheater. Amphitheaters usually have an indoor and an outdoor component, right? You guys know what I'm talking about. You go to, a, to an amphitheater to see a concert, there's like the stage, which is covered, but then there's a whole outside seating area. Yes? No? Is that a bit bad example? You guys know what an amphitheater is? Um, amphi means two, two states, okay? And B, uh, BIA is like bio, it just means like dual life. Okay, so they have two ways of, of living. Um, that refers to the fact that they're still aquatic or aquatic and terrestrial. Okay, so they live on the cusp. They reproduce in water, um, but some of them leave and go out onto land. So the reproduction piece still tied to water. Because their eggs don't have solid shells or leathery shells, and so they're, they're just sort of in like a membrane, and they have to be in the water or they'll dry out. You guys seen fish eggs and stuff? I mean not fish eggs, frog eggs before. They look like Jelly eyeballs. Okay. Just to give it a visual in case you've never seen frog eggs before. Because we're also, when we get to reptiles, we're going to talk about amniotic eggs, which are different. So let me show you um, amphibian eggs for reference. That's a good one. See that? These are frog eggs. They look like gelatinous eyeballs, yes? The, the membrane that's surrounding the outside of these eggs is just like a delicate, almost like a cell membrane, a little tougher than that, but it's not, um, it's not uh, desiccation resistant, so it's, it lets water in and out, okay? That's going to be an important, important comparison when we start looking at eggs and reptiles next. All right, so amphibians are going to remain tied to water for reproduction. They're also going to have uh, various types of respiration. They may use cutaneous respiration. What does that mean? You guys remember we talked about cutaneous skin, yeah. So cutaneous respiration means they can breathe through their skin. Um, they don't all do that, but they can. Some can. Some have lungs, some don't. Some are entirely dependent upon cutaneous respiration. Some have gills. Some have combinations of those, of those ways of breathing. But the big important takeaway here is that they're still tied to water. They have to remain moist in order to breathe, especially those that have gills or uh, skin respiration. And you have to have a moist surface for gas exchange. If you're dry, it doesn't work. So there are some uh, organisms like certain types of cecilians that live underground or some salamanders that have made transition to fully terrestrial life, and they have lungs. Okay, but the ones that don't, they're still tied to water, not just for, for reproduction, but also for respiration. So you'll see them living close to and or around the water in most cases. So you're talking about frogs, clearly, right? You're talking about salamanders, and you're talking about cecilians. These are the ones that most people may or may not have heard of before. You've probably heard, everybody's heard of a frog, yes? Okay, salamanders? Yes, most people are nodding. Cecilians, not so much, right? Um, they're legless, so they've lost those limbs, kind of like snakes in the reptile group. Um, a lot of them are eyeless, but they tend to be um, fossorial. They live underground. Um, but they're just sort of a third example of an amphibian. It's sort of a weirdo. Now you know. All right, so when we get here, let's see, what is this tree telling us? We have gotten through 
All right, so we're starting up here with fish. They've been fish or actinopterygians, remember, you'll need to know these terms. Uh, lobe fins come in at this uh, node. You got your coelacanths and your lungfish. When you get to tetrapods, that's where you see limbs and digits come in. Okay, so that's where we are here. We just talked about amphibians. The next branch, the next node, look what feature comes in. That's the amniotic egg. Okay, so again, we're talking about these evolutionary innovations that you see popping up in these different groups, right? At these different nodes. So do you, you have limbs with digits? Yeah, so you're in the tetrapod group. Um, you also have an amniotic egg, okay? We'll talk about what that means here in this slide. Um, amniotes include reptiles and mammals. Okay, so those are the last two groups we have to look at. Exclude amphibians. Okay, remember we just looked at those frog eggs and they're just sort of jelly-like um, egg cases. So with reptiles and mammals, you're looking at what we call amniotes. These are tetrapods with a terrestrially adapted egg. Okay, so the egg has a shell and it's either a leathery shell or a solid shell made of calcium-based compounds like you see in chicken eggs. Um, the egg contains specialized membranes that protect, feed, uh, help in the embryo respirate, right? So serve the embryo um, while it's developing inside of the egg. Again, this includes reptiles and mammals. Some other features that you see in amniotes are keratin skin outgrowths. What is that talking about? What are keratin skin outgrowths? What do you guys have that's made of keratin? Do you know? Hair. What else? Fingernails. Yep. So if you're talking about mammals, hair is a mammal thing. So reptiles don't have hair, but reptiles have feathers. Yes, those are keratin. Scales, those are keratin. Claws, instead of fingernails, they've got claws, right? Those are keratin. So you're talking about these keratin skin outgrowths. That's unique to amniotes. Um, and rib cage ventilation. So we have lungs and we have a rib cage that changes uh, volume to push air in and out. And that's also unique to amniotes. The important thing about the amniotic egg, the thing that I really want you guys to sort of take away from this group, is that now you're no longer dependent on water for reproduction. Because whether your eggs are leathery or whether they're shelled, they are uh, desiccation resistant. Okay, so you're not losing water. That means you can lay your eggs in a nest out of the water. This opens up niches. Right? This allows for the movement of animals away from the water. Your reliance on water is completely severed. I mean, other than drinking, obviously. But for reproduction, for breathing, you're good. You're fully terrestrial. Okay? So that's really the important thing that you see here at this division. So let's take a look at some reptiles really quick. You're probably familiar with most of these. Um, reptiles include three extant clades. So three different monophyletic groups within reptiles. You've got turtles, you've got lepidosaurs. So lepidosaurs include tuatara's lizards and snakes. Um, somewhere I had a picture of a tuatara. There it is. That's a tuatara. What it looks like over there. So but most of you probably know what lizards and snakes are. Um, and then the third plate is the archosaurs. And the archosaurs include crocodilians and dinosaurs. Wait. This says extant. What does extant mean? The living. But I've got dinosaurs on here. What am I talking about? Birds. Yeah. So birds are the only remaining lineage of true dinosaurs that made it through the KPG extinction. Um, so they're actually pretty cool. If you think about that. Pretty tough. Tough little birds. All right. So what do reptiles have that make them unique? Um, scales. Those are some of those keratin outgrowths that create a waterproof barrier. Now they are uh, free from the water, right? You can keep yourself from drying out because you've got waterproof shield. Um, shelled eggs laid on land and mostly ex ectothermic. Do you guys know what it means to be ectothermic? You heard that term before? We haven't covered it yet. We'll cover it in the next chapter on um, animal physiology. Ectotherms are animals that don't control their own body temperature internally. So the opposite would be an endotherm. So you're an endotherm. Your body heat is created by metabolic processes and you have fat to store it, right? You're an endotherm. You regulate your own body temperature. You can do things like shiver or sweat, right? You can thermoregulate. 
ectotherms have to rely on the external environment. So something like a snake will climb up onto a rock to bask when it's chilly, right? To get the sun to warm them up. And if they get too hot, they crawl back under into the shade. And so they use external forces, uh, external conditions to regulate their temperature. The, ex the exception in reptiles is birds, they're endotherms. Super high metabolism, but that makes sense, right? Because you've got to fly, you got to have a lot of uh, energy production. Okay, so they're endotherms. That'll make more sense when we do chapter 33 next. All right, so let's look at the three clades and we'll just quick examples. Um, you guys know what turtles are, right? This is kind of like frogs. Everybody's heard of a turtle, yeah? What is the characteristic of a turtle that first comes to mind? Shell, right? Um, can a turtle come out of its shell or is the shell part of the skeleton? What do you think? Yeah, it's part of the skeleton. So your upper and lower shields are your carapace and your plastron. Carapace is on the top, plastron is on the bottom, or the, should say ventral, right? Carapace is dorsal, plastron is ventral. These are made of fused vertebrae and ribs covered with modified scales. So if you look um, in the lab, there's actually, I think, still a, a skeleton, a, a turtle skeleton. You can see on the carapace uh, ribs and vertebrae fused in. It's actually pretty cool to see. So turtles are um, pretty diverse. Some live in the desert, others have returned to the sea. Here's a weird thing. When I'm talking about uh, turtles that have returned to the sea, who am I talking about? Who are these little dudes? Sea turtles, right? They, they live in the ocean as adults. They come out of the ocean to lay eggs on land, and then they go back to the water. When a sea turtle uh, nest hatches, the hatchlings follow the full moon back to the ocean to go live there forever. This is weird, a little, okay? Because let's think about this. The ancestors of this group are tied to water. Evolutionary innovation, amniotic egg, allows you to do what? Reproduce where? Yeah, you can go reproduce on land. That means you're free, you can go live on the land. But these weirdos went back to the sea, but they still come out to lay their eggs. The sea turtles are fully aquatic. They only like lumber up onto the beach during nesting season, dig a hole, lay a bunch of eggs, and go back to the ocean, never to return, unless they're breeding. And as soon as these little dudes hatch, they go straight back to the ocean to live their life. So it's interesting to think about having the evolutionary transition to reproduction on land and then returning to the water for your life, but you still got to come back up on land to reproduce. It's like the it's like the opposite almost of amphibians, you know? Anyway, maybe it's just me thinking about that kind of stuff, but I think it's kind of cool. All right, so that's turtles. Uh, oh, they don't have teeth. Just there you go. All right, here's our two Atara um, as a member of the, the Lepidosaurs. Um, these guys are an old basal lineage. Mostly you'll only find them on a few Pacific islands now, so they're they're not very uh, widespread, which is why most people never heard of the two Atara. But everybody's heard of lizards and everybody's heard of snakes, right? So snakes don't have what? that other tetrapods have. Legs, right? So we call them the legless lepidosaurs. Funny little alliteration. That evolved from lizard-like ancestors. Okay, so the ancestors of snakes had legs. We know that because of systematics, right? We know that because of fossils. We know that because some snakes still have vestigial leg bones. Right? We talked about that in one of the earliest chapters. Um, some snakes are highly venomous. We'll talk about that here in just a second. Um, gratuitous pictures of cute reptiles. You guys know those in the animal you have in Florida. You've probably seen them around. Uh, Eastern fence lizard. I know some of y'all are fans of reptiles. Where's Jacob when you need him? Jacob's not here. Um, you guys know this one? Five lines pink. Mexican beaded lizard. You look like that. It's a southern hog nose snake. And then this one. Pop it right. What about that one? Look at what color its mouth is. That's it. White, like cotton. Everybody? Cotton mouth? Not, not, not a bunch of snake people in here, huh? Okay. Ooh, Eastern Diamond Back Wild Snake. All those tools are poisonous, right? But if you don't know what they look like, how do you know if it's dangerous or not? I'll give you a flow chart. You guys ready? 
How do you know if it's dangerous? Are you leaving it alone? Yep, it's not dangerous. See where we're going? <laughs> you get it. If you are not leaving it alone, can it get away from you? If it can, it's not dangerous. If it cannot, what are you doing? Are you trying to harm it, kill it, grab it, harass it? If you're not, it's not dangerous. If you are, it's dangerous. Although it is in fact your actions that have put you in danger and not the snakes. So this is a public service announcement. It doesn't matter if you can identify snakes, right, by sight. Don't get close enough to, to tell. If you are not a snake biologist, there's no reason for you to mess with it, right? If you don't bother it, it will not bother you, okay? It makes me really sad when I hear stories of people who are just arbitrarily running around chopping off snake heads just because it's a snake, right? Like you go outside and you see one in your yard and you're like, yeah, with a shovel, there's no need for that, right? It's not doing anything, it's not coming for you. It's not gonna chase you down and bite you. In fact, even venomous snakes do not wish to waste their venom on you. Why not? What's the venom for? Mostly, do you think? Predators, yeah, to be, it's a predator. It's to kill prey, right? To neutralize them, to paralyze them, to kill them so they can eat them. Are they gonna eat you? No, it's not a mamba, right? It's a cotton mouth. okay? We don't have those big giant snakes here in the southeastern United States. Um, so, if, let's think about venom. Venom is a very expensive, uh, product to make. Okay, those toxic proteins take energy, uh, metabolic energy, nutrition, right, to put those compounds together, and they want to save it for when they're trying to catch a meal. In fact, some uh, venomous snakes as adults have the ability to do what's called a dry bite. It means they'll bite you, but they won't inject you with venom because they don't want to waste it. They just want you to leave them alone. They don't want to waste that venom on you. But the problem is young ones don't have that control yet. So if you come upon a, a young venomous snake and it's scared and you're harassing it uh, and it bites you, it can't help but inject you with venom. Okay. So the takeaway message is leave them alone. Okay. Belly first. They're not going to chase you. All right. That's my soapbox on snakes for now. All right. Let's talk about archosaurs. Remember, these are crocodilians and extant dinosaurs, aka birds. Um, so these guys are the two closely, most closely related groups of reptiles. So birds are more closely related to crocodiles and alligators than they are to things like snakes and lizards. Okay, so they're in this group, the archosaurs. Um, crocodilians, you've got crocodiles, alligators, uh, caimans and gharials. That's a caiman, that's a gharial. That is a crocodile, that is an alligator. Okay, the only two you might see in the United States are the crocodile and the alligator. If you want to see a crocodile, you've got to go pretty far south in Florida. So mostly, if you see one, it's probably an alligator, American alligator. But you can also tell the difference because their faces look different. An alligator has a U-shaped snout, a crocodile is more V-shaped. But the, oh, the other giveaway is, look, when his mouth is closed, can you see his teeth? Mm -hmm. No, that's an alligator. You can't see his teeth. This guy, crocodiles can't hide their teeth, even if they want to. So that's another way to tell them apart. Also, you don't have to get that close. You can just be like, look at that, guys, that's cool. And that's awesome, right? So those are crocodiles, uh, alligators, came in gharials. Many retain primitive archosaur characters. That's not too hard to imagine that these guys are so, sort of like living fossils, right? They look like ancient beasts. <laughs> it doesn't take too much imagination, right? They haven't changed a lot through um, evolutionary history. All right, so that gets to the most interesting group of all. Just kidding, you guys know I like birds though. Um, and that's the, the dinosaurs or the birds. So dinosaur diversity is lower than it is in, than it has been in the past. Obviously, only the birds remain, but they are the most diverse tetrapod lineage. So we already said that fish, actinopterygian, ray-finned fishes are the most diverse vertebrate lineage, but they live in the water. So if you take them out of the equation by saying tetrapod, meaning verte uh, terrestrial vertebrate, birds win. Okay, so there are about 10,000 species of birds or so. And we said 30,000 for fish. So they still win in the water. So if you take the aquatic ones out of the equation, um, birds are the most diverse. Lots of modification in this group. So lots of differences in birds than what you see in any of the other reptiles, even the crocodilians to which they're most closely related. But a lot of that is because most of their relatives went extinct. Okay, at the KPG extinction. So 
Some things that are, well, I'll show you that uh, tree here in just a second. So some of the important characteristics that birds have uh, that are unique among reptiles are hollow bones. What is inside of your bones, do you know? Marrow, yep. Uh, their bones are hollow. Their scales have been modified into feathers. They don't have teeth. We talked about the gene mutation, right? That took, that took the teeth away in birds. Um, and they don't have a bladder, like a urinary bladder to store liquid waste. Why do you think these are important? What do these things all have in common that would help if you were a bird? Lighter, it's weight, right? So your bones are lightweight. Your scales are modified into feathers to help you fly. Um, teeth, you don't need them if you have a good functional beak and they're just kind of extra weight. And you don't hang on to your liquid waste because, or liquid waste because that's heavy, right? So all of these modifications are specializations for flight. So birds, the, the, flight, the ancestor that gave rise to the, all, the, all the birds was flighted. Okay, it was a flighted organism. The birds that you see now that don't fly have reverted to flightless. Kind of like the sea turtles that came out of the ocean and then went back, right? Or mammals like dolphins and whales that were out of the land and then went back, right? So flightless birds have reverted to that, um, that form. Okay, so all birds come from a flighted ancestor. So when you look at things like um, an ostrich or things that don't fly, penguins, right? They're, um, that's a derived characteristic or a secondary loss of flight. All right, so they're descended from within a group of bipedal carnivorous dinosaurs called theropods. Guess who else was in this group? Our good friend, Tyrannosaurus rex. So birds are living relatives of T-Rex, which is kind of cool to think about. Um, this is a T-Rex foot from a museum, like a model. That is a turkey foot. You guys see, this, see the homology? You can just look at them and see how close to the, uh, similar they are in shape, right? Three toes forward, one toe back. T-Rex, turkey. Cool, okay. Um, and remember that birds have endotherm. They set their own metabolic rate. They make their own body heat. Endotherms require a tremendous amount of energy because you're constantly burning calories to make that heat, right? But birds have to be that way because it takes a lot of energy to fly. And they're, and they're also constantly vigilant, looking, 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 ready to fly because there's predators everywhere, right? Um, yeah, endotherms, all these characteristics you want to know came from dinosaurs, that's good stuff. All right, here's the tree I was talking about. Our root here is the ancestral amniote. Okay, so meaning the first place you see amniotic eggs, you've got reptiles, you've got synapsids. The synapsid group is going to eventually give rise to mammals. Okay, but right now, that's not what we're talking about. We're looking at this lineage of reptiles. So on this tree, you've got all these groups. There's your turtles, there's your crocodiles, pterosaurs like pterodactyl, uh, ornithischian dinosaurs, saurischian dinosaurs, birds, plesiosaurs, ichthyosaurs, etc. If we forward and we take out the groups that went extinct, we can see the lineage a little bit more clearly now. Right? So you've got uh, reptiles, you've got archosaurs, there's your crocodilians. Here's that branch, but all these groups are gone. Okay, so these closest relatives uh, to birds, other than crocodilians, all went extinct. Okay, at the last major extinction event, the last major boundary uh, when the big asteroid hit. Okay, we'll talk about that in a later chapter towards the end in more detail. Um, but only the birds survived. But this makes it a little bit easier to sort of think about how this group is so different than this group, right? How the birds are so different from crocodilians, even though that's their closest extant relative. It's not their closest relative, just their closest extant relative. Does that make sense? So you've got other groups that had modifications for flight. You've got other groups that may have had feathers that definitely have feathers. And things that you see in birds that are unique were shared in these other groups in some instances, but those groups are gone. Okay. All right. So this is just pictures. Biggest bird versus smallest bird. Not in the world, but some good examples of size diversity. What's this? I think it's an ostrich. It might be an emu. I can't remember, but they look really similar. What's that one? You guys know? It's a hummingbird. Did you see a mockingbird or hummingbird? Oh, it's, a, it's hard to tell because it's the size, but they're really like little ruby throats. They'll be back any day now. Um, 
migrating back from South America where they were where they were um, spending the winter. So these guys will be around. They're tiny. How big are these? Ostriches and emus. Like taller than me. Okay. Flightless. Uh, move their wings faster than any other birds. Right. So some other some good examples of uh, diversity. This is just size diversity. So when uh, the other dinosaurs went extinct, birds weren't always tiny. Okay. I mean, I realize like an emu is big now, but most birds you think of as being pretty small. Um, but in the fossil record, not that long ago, also, which is kind of interesting, we had birds that looked like this compared to a man. This red one, um, its common name was the terror bird, terror, T E R R O R. That makes sense. If I was walking on the street and this thing came at me, terror, yes? Um, so, actually, in um, South America, these guys were the sort of king predators before people, okay? But when the um, Isthmus of Panama came up out of the water and connected North America and South America, the North American predators were uh, mammals, cats, and stuff like that. And they outcompeted the big, huge birds. But there are actually fossils of terror birds that were found in the southeastern, uh, southeastern and southwestern US, like Florida, Texas. So they got here, but they didn't make it very far because the carnivores, um, the mammalian carnivores, outcompeted them. So that's just a little bit about bird evolution. Um, let's see, fastest one in the air, that's a peregrine falcon that can dive at speeds of 200 miles per hour. That's fast. And then who's this guy? A penguin. Not very fast in the air, doesn't fly at all. Not very fast at all on land for his waddle strength. You guys have probably seen half his feet. But a rocket in the water, right? So another example of just adaptation and diversity. Songbird diversity, uh, just color, feather coloration. So lots of interesting species. Um, lots of different independent lineages that have uh, honed in on predatory behavior. So your raptors and your owls think like falcons and hawks and that's an owl. This is a songbird. This is a shrike. This little guy, hmm, about that tall. We have them around here. They're not super abundant, but you can find them living out near like cow pastures and stuff. They really like barbed wire fences because they will go catch stuff and then they will impale it on the thorny spikes of the barbed wire. That's hardcore for a songbird, don't you think? Um, this is also the same, this is another bird, so they're bird on bird violence, right? Which is not uncommon, especially in raptors. Um, that's his head, that's his body. Those are two different thorns of barbed wire, two different ones. Okay? So don't mess with the shrub. But anyway, it's just interesting because it's not all one lineage that went that direction of uh, predatory birds. So these are multiple different derived lineages that do that kind of stuff. So that's just diversity. Okay. Bird ran over. So snakes and birds, right? I've got, got a thing, obviously. All right, how are we doing? Cool. Um, we're on to mammals. We're really getting close to home now, right? We're mammals, yes? All right, so what is a mammal? Well, they're named for the mammary glands. And what do mammary glands do? Produce milk. So feed your young with milk, that's a mammal thing. Hair, I mentioned, is a mammal thing. That is for insulation, okay? Protection, maybe, of your skin from UV rays, but mostly insulation. Differentiated teeth. Are all of your teeth shaped the same, or do you have different versions of teeth? Are all your teeth shaped exactly the same way? No, right? You have nippers and grinders and pointy ones for tearing, right? You have multi-purpose teeth. That's what differentiated teeth means. That's a mammal thing. We're all endotherms. We're all capable of regulating our own body temperature. Uh, within mammals, multiple lineages have gone back to the sea, like whales and dolphins, which I mentioned, manatees, seals, right? So lots of mammals that made their way back to the ocean. Interestingly, in mammals, there's only one species, one lineage that has true flight, and that's bats. Bats are the only flying mammals. What about flying squirrels, you might ask? Are they really flying? They're not. What are they doing? They're gliding, yeah. They've got skin flaps, but they don't have actual powered wing flight. That's only bats. So those guys are unique in um, the mammal group. All right, within mammals, there are three lineages. I will ask you guys to be familiar with these. 
Let's start with the eutheriums here at the bottom. This is the placental mammal. Have you guys heard of a placenta before? What is a placenta associated with? When do you hear people talking about placenta? Yeah, like babies, childbirth, pregnancy. So in eutheriums, um, placental, they're placental mammals because they complete their embryonic development within a uterus internally, joined to the mother by the placenta. Okay, this is the vast majority of mammals do this. Okay, so this is the newest lineage, youngest lineage, most derived lineage, but also the most successful. Okay. So you see um, other animals in these other two groups, marsupials and monotremes, but far fewer than what you see in eutherian mammals. So most, most mammals that have a placenta and complete development in the uterus. We'll back it up a, uh, one step to marsupials. Do you guys know what marsupials are? What do they have? Or can you give me an example? Anybody heard that term before? Yeah, they have a pouch, a marsupium, in which their young complete development. So they have a tiny little embryo that is born small, usually blind, hairless, completely helpless, so super underdeveloped, and it crawls its way into the pouch and it finishes developing there. Inside the pouch is where you find the mammary glands in marsupials uh, with nipples. So the little tiny baby embryo crawls in, finds a nipple, latches on, hangs out until it's fully grown, until it's ready to leave the pouch. Okay, so examples of that are things like kangaroos. That's the first thing that comes to mind, right? You think about a pouch, a little joey poking his head out of the pouch. Uh, koalas are marsupials. Opossums are marsupials. Opossums are the only North American marsupials. So those little creepy dudes that you see on the side of the road all the time, I think they're creepy. I'm working on it. <laughs> um, they are, are, are our only marsupials that are native to North America. So that's kind of cool to know. And then you got your monotremes. These dudes are the weirdest of all, but they were the original. These are the OG mammals, okay? Retain the ancestral egg laying condition. So these weirdos still lay eggs. And okay? you've got egg laying mammals. This includes echidnas and the platypus. Within echidnas, I think there are three, four, or five genera. I can't remember if it's somewhere between three and five, but not very many. So not a huge amount of diversity, and there's only one kind of platypus. And that's it for monotremes. So the um, development of marsupial pouch and eutheria placenta is clearly a better route for success, but there are still some extant monotremes, the echidnas and the platypus. Um, they also don't have nipples which seems like a weird thing. If you're going to have mammary glands, you should have some way to deliver that milk to your young, but they just have their glands in their skin. So they just secrete milk and their young will latch onto a clump of fur and use it as like a little siphon to get the milk. I mean, clearly there are better ways, right? So you can sort of see why, the, why evolution favored these adaptations, right? All right, so I want you guys to know those definitions. I want you to know what the characteristics of each are and uh, throw me an example, okay? Or if you get an example, be able to label what, which group of mammals are going to. How are we feeling? Feeling good about mammals? How about primates? Now we're really getting close, right? Moving down that tree. So we're going to spend a very brief amount of time running through the evolution of primates, okay? Um, Here's the ancestral primate, first branch lemurs, lorises, and bush babies. Do you guys know what those are? There's a picture. The photo tour through primate evolution is what we're going to do here. Uh, loris, bush baby, lemurs. You guys seen Madagascar? The movie? I don't know what she's talking about. Anyway, if you get a chance, maybe it's on Netflix, I don't know. But the lemurs are, they are primarily featured in that movie. It's because they're um, native to not All right, so that's the first branch, oldest branching branching lineage. Next branching lineage is parsiers. That's what parsier looks like. Kind of like so ugly, they're cute, right? Also, here's the thing that I like to look at the most. Look at this hand. They don't look that much like you and me at first glance. You not look, right? But look at those hands. I mean, right? You can see that that similarity. That's really cool. All right. New world monkeys are next. Old world monkeys come from there. Um, 
have to not. So we're looking at with New World monkeys. Um, these guys are going to have prehensile tails, so tails that are used like a another appendage to grab things, to hold on to limbs, to swing from trees, um, stuff like that. And then when you get to your old world monkeys, they still have tails, but they don't use them to grab things. Okay, so that's some differences there also with where you find them in the world. Um, another thing that happens with the old world monkeys as we're getting closer to our, our closest relatives is forward facing nostrils. Okay, so the shape of the face changes a little bit in this group. Gibbons, orangutans, that's a given, that's an orangutan. So we're getting closer to our relatives which are uh, the great apes, including gorillas, chimpanzees, and bonobos. So those are our closest relatives. When we talk about sharing 99% DNA with chimpanzees, that's these dudes. Chimps and bonobos are about equally close to us genetically. So that gets us right here. Okay, shared nodes only less than 10 million years ago. Split from that group that led to chimps and bonobos and the group that led to homo sapiens. Okay. Again, it's kind of the same story as saying, like, I'm not saying you're a fish. I'm not saying you're a chimpanzee. I'm saying you share an ancestor with the group that led to chimps and bonobos seven million years ago. Okay. Right? Yeah. Does that make sense? So that was one of the things that we talked about when we were doing um, misconceptions about evolution that people will argue, like, well, you say that we came from from chips or whatever, but nobody's really saying that. We're just saying that we're sharing some separate lineages, but you gotta know a little bit about evolution to be able to sort of understand that statement anyway. So that's not your job to teach people. Okay, this is just a little run through um, of hominid evolution. So when we're talking about hominids, we're talking about those that led directly to the genus Homo, which is us. So about 7 million, 6.5 million years ago, what this, what this, image is representing are fossils that have been found and when in the sort of uh, strata they were found. When in, evolutionary, when in evolutionary history did these species exist based on where and what was found in the fossil record. Okay, so that's what we're looking at here. Um, Sahelanthropus is the oldest fossil 6.5 million years ago of something that would have been split from that lineage that became ships and was heading toward uh, humans. Okay, so that's pretty old. Um, we've got some other groups along the way here. Another cool thing about this graphic, if you have some time to sort of look at it, um, is that these bars represent how long each of these species was present on the earth. Okay, so what this means is, let's say, for example, um, Artipithecus, fossils have been found from as old as, what, 5.7 million years ago to as recently as 4.4 million years ago. So these guys existed in the fossil record for like 2 million years. Okay, so it doesn't mean we found one skull and it was five million years old. It means we found fossils of Artipithecus all the way through this portion of evolutionary time. Does that make sense? So the bars, the bigger the bars, the longer those species were present, okay, before they go extinct. So you can sort of follow that um, evolution through time until you get up to the first Homo, first member of the genus Homo, three and a half million, wait, no, sorry, two and a half million years ago, that's where the bar is. Lasted for about a million years in the fossil record. This is Homo habilis. This means pansy man. So, as far back as Homo habilis, Homo uh, species in the genus Homo were using tools. Okay, so that's cool. A um, couple more species here Homo ergaster, Homo, Homo erectus. Look at this bar. This guy was in the record for a really long time. Most successful hominid lineage thus far. It lasted the longest. Um, questionable extinction, overlapped with Neanderthalensis. Guess who else overlapped with Neanderthalensis? Homo, Homo sapiens. Okay, so there's lots of in interesting research going on and genetic work being done that actually shows that many of us carry Neanderthal DNA, meaning that there was interbreeding between Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis before Neanderthals went completely extinct, probably because sapiens out competed most likely, right? So that's kind of cool. What I want you guys to take away from this are uh, two traits that arise in this lineage that lead to, lead to modern humans. And one of them you can guess just by looking at the shape of these skulls going forward through time, what you notice. And what's happening to the shape of the, of, of the skull? 
Yeah, brain case gets bigger, right? So brain tissue increases. So you're getting more complex, probably more intelligent evolution of things like, again, tools, metabolists, right? And then as you move on, uh, speech and things like that. The other thing is bipedalism. So even if you look back at uh, chimps, they, they still walk on four, right? They have their hands down, but um, lineage, the, homo, the lineage, the hominid lineage is uh, bipedalism. So we basically stood up. Okay, when you're walking around on all four, and then you they figure out how to stand up and walk. Now this didn't happen again, it looks like that one time when somebody stood up, but over time, right? Uh, small tweaks to anatomy that allow for that to happen. You free up your hands to do what? Anything, right? Start using tools. You see? So you can sort of see this evolution of behavior going along with evolution of anatomy. Um, but I want you guys to know I'm not going to ask you to tell me anything about these historical hominid um, relatives. I just think it's interesting and I'd like to talk about it a little bit, but I'm not going to make you guys memorize any of this. What I do want you to know are these two features that are um, your evolutionary innovations in the hominid lineage, bipedalism and large brain, okay? And I also want you to know these three species, Homo erectus, we go back here, this is the third one back. Most successful lineage in the fossil record for the longest um, of all of the um, hominids, so up to 2 million years, so doing pretty well for a pretty long time. Um, Neanderthalensis, I want you to know, overlap with sapiens. Okay, so we shared the earth for a while. This appeared from the fossil record about 25,000 years ago, but modern humans um, appeared 200,000 years ago. So a pretty long period of overlap between uh, Homo sapiens and Neanderthalensis. So I want you to know that. And then um, I want you to know when we appeared in the fossil record, which is about 200,000 years ago. So if you think about the age of the earth, 4.6 billion years, we basically just got to the party, right? In the big scheme of things. So that's kind of cool to think about. That's it for vertebrates, okay? That was a long journey through animals, wasn't it? You guys have questions? None that you can think of right now, right? If you come up with anything, just let me know. So for the next exam, it's still a couple of weeks away. I think it's like first week of April, right? Right before spring break. If I remember correctly, look at the syllabus. And then we'll talk about project. I just looked at this. I think it is the Wednesday. No, it's the 31st, March 31st, is when that, that um, exam will open. So let's look at this again. Yeah. Wednesday, uh, March 31st at noon through Thursday, April 1st at 11.59. So your Wednesday, Thursday stretch like we usually have. Here's what's gonna be on it. 27, 28, 29. Okay, that's invertebrates, vertebrates, and that 27 was the intro to animals where we talked about classification features and cox genes and all that good stuff, okay? Um, 33 is form and function. So that's animal physiology. We'll start on that Wednesday. And then 30, Four through 43. Remember, I told you guys this, but I'll remind you that sounds like a lot of chapters. Those are your body systems, okay? We're going to do body systems, but we're not going to do them in depth. If you need in depth education on body systems, you are going to take anatomy and physiology at some point in your life, okay? That's not, the, that's not this class, but we are going to go through each of the body systems. So when I have all these chapters on here, do not panic. It is a selection of material from each of those chapters. One or two slides for each body system, so nothing serious, all right? Lots of terminology, lots of talk about physiology and form and function, but you don't have to read 11 chapters on body systems, okay? So don't freak out. Um, and that'll be the, all the stuff that's on exam three. When we get back from spring break, uh, ecology from here on out. Ecology, ecosystems, uh, biosphere, conservation. So we're getting towards that large scale sort of community, um, community biology stuff. 